I'll take you through um, what I think is a pretty interesting project. I'm biased, but uh, I spent a couple years working on this with a number of collaborators. Uh, first and foremost, Tom Eide, who I hired to work on this project. He has an ecological modeling skill set. I've since uh, hired him on a, as a full-time researcher at the Pearl Lab. Um, but we roped a lot of other folks into this project. Uh, nine up there, economists and ecologists. And you know, just to preface this uh, presentation a little bit, I'm an economist. A lot of the heavy lifting in this project was on the ecological modeling side of things. I won't speak terribly well about that. Josh did a wonderful job talking about economics. Uh, even though he is a has a PhD in biology, I won't do as well talking about the ecology here. I promise. So, I'll kind of leave some gaps and direct you to my colleagues or, or Tom uh, if you'd like to learn more about some of that. Okay. So, what were the project goals here? Uh, we wanted to develop a model that was reflective of oyster of, an, of a restored oyster reef in the Choptank River system. Um, and then understand how uh, that restoration and different levels of restoration affect uh, fisheries harvest, especially the important fisheries, uh, commercially uh, quite important fisheries such as blue crab, the trot line fishery over there. So once we have the harvest changes, then we'd like to understand the uh, changes in revenues to fishers and ultimately something called multiplier effects, how that change in revenue is spent within a regional economy to generate uh, indirect and induced impacts beyond just that initial pulse of money that goes in the fisher's pocket. And as I said, we compare that across different restoration scenarios. So this model, like I said, uh, involved linking ecology and economics. We started with a, a food web model called Ecopath. I'll get into some very uh, 30,000 foot view detail on that in a little bit. And out of that, uh, we have ha harvest changes, harvested biomass for different fish species. And then from that, fisheries revenue. A uh, pretty straightforward procedure is used just uh, to translate the, the harvest into revenues and multiplying the harvest in pounds by a mean per uh, unit price of the fish, then that change in revenue went into an economic uh, impact model called Implan that calculates indirect and induced effects to regional economies. Uh, we focused on Dorchester and Talbot County on the eastern shore here. Uh, and then ultimately we get the, the metrics that so many policymakers and managers are concerned about nowadays, which is jobs, income, and those types of metrics that really resonate at the, at the management and the political level. So breaking it down to three major scenarios, we use as a kind of a status quo or what exists on the ground or in the water now, which is this young restored reef. And then we by, by manipulating the bivalves, the oysters, and the associated filter feeders, we get different, two different scenarios. For example, if we let this reef mature and it reaches the restoration objectives, what is the status of that ecosystem down the road? And on the contrary, what if we decide to harvest that reef down to the point it was prior to any restoration. And what are the differences in economic impacts, right? And that's what economists would call as a management relevance, a marginal analysis. And you change the policy, how does the economic impacts change, right? It's not the total value of some resource, like an existence value that Dr. Ginsburg mentioned earlier. Uh, what, what, what's the value of polar bears in Alaska, that type of thing, which matters, but may have limited policy importance. Uh, something like this is, is quite relevant when we talk, we look at the discussion ongoing about what to do with this uh, restoration and how to proceed in the future. 
So just to give you some background on the Maryland uh, oyster sanctuaries, uh, there really was were very few acres prior to 2009. Uh, through the Maryland Oyster Restoration and Aquaculture Development Plan, an objective was to increase that from 9% to 25%. Uh, and that was uh, success in protecting those sanctuaries. This area in, with the square here that I just uh, highlighted, that's the Chop Tank River system, and that's the area that we're focusing on. That's where all, this expensive, somewhat controversial restoration uh, has occurred. So a finer look at that, I think many of you know, uh, some of you may not, there were three tributaries where restoration efforts were focused. The first is Harris Creek up there at the top left of the square. Um, that is complete. Uh, approximately 2 billion oysters have been planted across nearly uh, 400 acres. At the Treading Avon River down here, uh, the goal was almost 200 acres. It, it really is kind of bogged down. Uh, and it's on hold. It didn't, it, I believe right now it's about 20% complete. Uh, just some challenges there. I think mostly political. Uh, and then the little Chop Tank River down there. So economists talk about benefits and talk about costs. This is very expensive restoration. Uh, over $50 million has been spent on oyster restoration in this area. So a lot of folks want to know What's the return on investment? And at some time, that, you know, that could be hard to quantify. We want to restore the environment for more reasons than dollars and cents, of course. But it helps if we can quantify the dollars and cents. And what we do in this project is that commercial fisher bump from this restoration and the enhanced food web. So. The first time I saw this graph or this image, I was terrified and I asked my ecologist colleagues what it was and they called it a horrendogram. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I believe there's a technical term that's more accurate, but I didn't need to know anything more than that. I, I call it a horrendogram and it is lines and, and, and dots and small and big all over the place, but it's a trophic model, it's, it's a food web model. At the bottom, you see like the phytoplankton, the primary producers there. And then at the very top, you have the top level of the food chain, which is, or the food web, which is the fishers, the trot line, the eel potters, the gill netters, et cetera. And right in the middle here, shouldn't it say in the middle, at the kind of lower part, right after the primary producers there, uh, are those bivalves, the oysters, the hooked mussels. And what we do in the model, in the ecopath models, manipulate those to understand what changes in the environment in terms of harvest if you reach restoration goals or if you harvest all of the oysters back down to original pre-restoration levels. So again, three policy scenarios the current restored reef, the mature reef, this ideal state in the future that includes these associated filter feeders, right? And then thirdly, that no oyster sanctuary fish down. So one of the uh, most uh, interesting and um, powerful findings of the Ecopath model is the blue crab fishery, the trial line fishery, I just focused right there, uh, I uh, highlight right there via that, um, that oval. So at the top of there of the, of the table, you can see the different fisheries. Uh, you have pound net, gill net, different ways of catching fin fish. But if you compare a mature oyster reef to the current young reef, at the mature level, you have an 80% increase in blue crab harvest, about 2.4 million blue, additional blue crabs harvested each year. And I think most folks know how valuable that fishery is. That was a very interesting and powerful finding from our, uh, this model. Frankly, it, it swamps the other findings in terms of uh, uh, economic impacts, certainly, but even just the biomass harvested, right? Um, so we have harvest now, right? So translating harvest into revenues. 
what I discussed earlier is a pretty straightforward approach. Multiply the pounds harvested by a mean per unit price obtained from Maryland DNR uh, seafood dealer records. So an economist would critique that and say, yeah, well, what about substitutes? What if the increase is so large that you now have this greater supply and you're going to have a lower price, right? So more supply, all else, all else held equal, the price would be lower. Well, we kind of beg off of that essentially by saying that the Chop Tank River system is a m kind of minor component of a very large Chesapeake Bay blue crab uh, fishery, and which also has substantial competition from imports overseas and from the southeastern United States and the Gulf of Mexico too, right? So the regional economic impact analysis, that's what we're, the stage of this project we're at right now that I'm describing, this four key metrics output, which is, that's just a measure of the sales that occur in a region, right? Labor income, value added, which is the, uh, essentially the output minus the interme intermediate inputs, and then finally, one of the things you hear about all the time in the news and from policymakers, politicians, is jobs. What are the employment effects? And for each of those four measures, we have three different types of effects. So the direct effect, which is that initial effect, the initial spending change, right? Million dollars extra in blue crab harvest. That fisher pays his crew. That fisher buys bait, repairs his or her boat, but then the person that supplies the bait also has to buy products for them, for their business. So you have those, those are called indirect effects, right? And the induced effects come from both the direct indir and indirect, and that's the additional income that people have from this spending that they can use to buy goods and services within that regional economy. And so that's so translating revenues into impacts. Um, how do commercial fishers allocate these revenues across different expenditure categories? And that's really the key. We need to know those relationships in order to accurately identify and characterize these economic impacts. We use a specialized model called M-Plan to do that. There's all these industry linkages that sync up industries and really relate how each industry engages with other industries. Uh, there is a generic commercial fishing industry that is one of those 528 industries in Implan. It's judged to be insufficient for our purposes. The uniqueness of the Chop Tank River system, trot line fishery especially, uh, it's not well captured by the generic fishery, which captures a lot of, or accounts for, you know, offshore, long line, sword fishing, that, those types of uh, large vessel, open ocean fishing activities. So what we did, we didn't plan on doing this at the beginning, uh, is talk to a bunch of fishers in the Chop Tank River system and sought to understand how they allocate their expenditures across different cost, cost categories right here. I mean, there's a lot there. The point is not the numbers. The point is there's about 25 or so cost categories on the left-hand side there. And we looked across nine different fisheries, asked fishers, well, how, how much do you allocate to uh, buying bait or to paying your crew? paying yourself right proprietor income what's your what's your uh, income or profit we didn't ask that specifically to give a dollar amount but ask for percent allocations obviously that would help with the privacy concerns and to get fishers commercial fishers buy-in so what are the key findings here uh, oyster reef restoration uh, supports a large increase in biomass harvesting uh, 45%, uh, so the mature reef uh, is, is greater than, uh, is 45% more than a young reef, kind of where we're at right now, again, uh, and 80% greater than that fish down reef, or you could view it as a pre-restoration reef, but the bottom line is there's no sub substantive uh, reef in that area, right? Uh, the, the key finding number two was a 
large increase in blue crab harvest from uh, you know our model. It was uh, it's quite impressive to the point that I got a little nervous when I saw how, how large it was. Uh, and we're actually currently running some sensitivity analyses on it on it right now, but it appears to be pretty narrow. We do have a, a fairly high degree of confidence in these in these findings. So dockside sales, that's the direct effect that goes into that fisher's pocket, right? Uh, you have about $4.5 million increase in dockside um, sales for a mature reef relative to the young reef and $11 million annually when you compare the ideal future restored reef with no reef, which is kind of what it's all about, right? We spent $50 million, we being the taxpayers of this country, this is federally funded restoration, spent $50 million on this. Well, we're getting, we are getting $11 million. Uh, we have to be careful, and I, I, I don't want to go into a tangent here, but this is not a classic benefit cost analysis. This is an economic impact analysis. So it's not comparing apples to oranges, but at the same time, $11 million a year for this area is uh, something that you know, people in Dorchester and Talbot County, uh, I think, would really care about. Um, so here's the final table uh, that highlights, on the right, I have a, a red square, the annual regional economic impacts for those four key measures that we've discussed. Uh, $23 million in total sales. Now that's direct, indirect, and induced. The total sales impacts about $23 million annually is what our ecological economic model predicted and over 300 annual jobs supported by the restoration. So in summary, we have a large socioeconomic impact here uh, that's not accounting for some other socioeconomic impacts. We did a small side project that looked at the economic impacts from the reef construction expenditures, the spending to actually put the reef in place. And you can see the amounts there. Total economic uh, output from that is uh, over $100 million. Uh, and this just scratches the surface on the, the, the benefits. There's a number of other benefits, some of which could be, um, you know, accounted for in economics terms, water filtration, the removal of nutrients, recreational fishing was not accounted for here. Um, so, uh, yep, and that's, that's it in a nutshell. So I'd be happy to take any questions from you. Thank you. I was curious, what's kind of the balance that you think would occur as far as increased production per fisherman versus new fishermen entering into it for, for a report situation like that? Well, we're lo looking for somebody to fund that next study, <laughs> basically, is the, is the short answer. Uh, this project, this model, does not incorporate fisher behavior in that way. Clearly, fishers are going to make decisions based on the increased harvest. More would come into the area, et cetera. So we do not account for that decision process in this. So um, to the extent the fishers are mobile and able to adjust quickly, then uh, our model would, would not, certainly would not do a good job. It does not, does not capture that. But it, it should be looked at and could be looked at. Yep. Yeah. Another one that's maybe uh, external to what was in this study, and that's sustainability. You get that $22 million out of the fish out uh, things. Can that go on year after year, or is that a one shot deal? Yeah, so that, that can. That's, that amount of money um, is sustainable. The ecological model um, produces that additional harvest through that through the additional oysters and the food web, through the restoration. So that is a sustainable amount um, in theory, according to the model. Again, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah, it's more of a problem, but I felt bad you're beating yourself up over a $50 million capital investment. Mm -hmm. when, it, when an industry goes away, you got to retrain those people. $50 million is about 
one and a half community college buildings. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, the, so, so the comment is that fifty million dollars is not that much money. I mean, when you consider the loss. Well, I mean, I think you can always say that a certain amount of uh, money it was not uh, that much relative to a B two bomber or, or what have you, right? I mean, the reality is, is uh, uh, expensive. You know, that fifty million dollars could have been spent on a lot of different other types of restoration as well, or other environmental measures, reforestation, and. Uh, we do need to think, I believe, as economists and, and ecologists to think about, and, and restoration folks, to think about the trade-offs and what we're getting uh, in terms of economic values and, and also, you know, just the values to the environment, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks very much.